If you're too light, you'll come to the surface. If you're too heavy, you'll go to the bottom. In order to obtain or achieve neutral buoyancy, the weight of the vehicle has to be the same as the weight of the water it displaces. Now if we were to put internal tanks in here, it would increase the weight of the submarine when we flooded them. It would also increase the weight of the submarine when it was on dry land. So what we do is we put two external ballast tanks. We we'll call them main ballast tanks, one forward and one aft. And think of these ballast tanks like two airbags. The forward one will give 320 pounds of buoyancy. The after one will give 380 pounds of buoyancy. They're open at the bottom so that the pressure inside remains the same as the sea pressure outside. Just remember, think of them as lift bags. Their purpose is to get the pressure hull of that submarine, the conning tower, well above water so it's safe to open the hatch and their other function is to instantaneously start the submarine towards the surface. You don't try to measure the water or the air in them. They're either full of water or full of air. Now, in order to obtain, uh, to achieve neutral buoyancy, you're going to have to have a hard tank, which we call a variable ballast tank. And you let water into that tank sufficiently in order to take small uh, in order to take care of small changes in temperature of the water or salinity of the water, all of which affect the density of the water and make the submarine appear to be the, either lighter or heavier than it is. Let's go through a dive just briefly to see how this works. We have a valve here, an external valve with a handle on the inside of the conning tower, which will vent the forward main ballast tank. We have another one on the other side, which will vent the after main ballast tank. We open the two handles inside the conning tower. It lets the water come up in, in the ballast tanks, gets rid of the air, lets the water come up, and the submarine starts to sink. When these tanks are full, the new water line is approximately over the top of the side viewports. Now then, we have another valve which lets water into the variable ballast tank. That comes up inside like this. The handle is right in back of the operator's seat. That lets water come into the tank. But in order to fill the tank completely, you've got to let the air out of it. And we have another valve up here. The operator opens that valve, and the submarine starts to sink again. As soon as it sinks so that the new water line goes the water starts to appear at the top of the hatch over the, over the viewport. The operator shuts off the vent valve to the VVT and he shuts the flood valve. 
And at that time, he is empirically at neutral buoyancy. The, at that time, the submarine, any external force, can push the submarine either down or push the submarine up. Now, what is the external force? The external force to make it go down is the motor. You have two motors on the outside which can be thrust the motors which can be rotated through 360 degrees. By pushing the motor that way, it'll force the submarine down. Push the motor that way, it'll force the submarine up. Now, to make the submarine move ahead, you have a stern motor. And this motor is a three horsepower motor. And that motor is set as an active rudder. The operator has a rudder bar up here, which he can move the direction of this motor with its feet, so it, he can, just like in an airplane, he can make it go left or make it go right. One thing to remember about these motors, although this motor is only a half horsepower, it's an electrical motor, and as a rule of thumb, for the actual comparison with a gasoline outboard motor, you can multiply by four. So that motor would be equivalent to a two horsepower outboard. This motor would be equivalent to a 12 horsepower outboard. All right, now where does the power come that makes the motors turn. You have, on either side, we'll remove the, we'll remove the variable balance tank, and we'll put a battery pod. We have two battery pods. Inside the battery pods, you have four batteries. Three batteries are for propulsion, for propulsion, and the fourth one is for auxiliary power like lights, the scrubber system, and and any uh, and any other thing you might have, like uh, uh, the lighting, internal lighting, uh, or uh, lighting for the internal compass. These three batteries are hooked up in series so that they provide 36 volts. The fourth battery remains at 12 volts. So much for the power for the propulsion system. Now, what do we have for safety features? Well, the main, you can blow the forward main ballast tank, that'll get you to the surface. You can blow the after main ballast tank, that'll get you to the surface. You can blow the variable ballast tank that we just erased, that will get you to the surface. You can point the motors like this, if you're at neutral buoyancy, that will get you to the surface. But let's suppose that you've used up all your high pressure air, and incidentally, the high pressure air comes from two scuba tanks, which are located inside the submarine. I'll just take the motor off and we'll go to the internal side. Two scuba tanks, one on either side. On one scuba tank, we keep lined up on the high pressure system of the submarine. On the other one, we keep a, a scuba regulator. So let's assume you've used up all your high pressure air. And let's assume that your batteries are flat. You've used up all your battery power. How do you get back to the surface then? Well, on either side of the inboard, on either inboard side of the battery pods, and let me go to a cross-section area now of, this, of the submarine. And put the hatch with the viewport on top like that. We'll put the port in like that. We'll put the pressure hull in like that. And then we'll show the two 
battery pods, the variable ballast tank between the two battery pods. Now, in between the variable ballast tank and the battery pods on each side, we will put a drop lead weight with a handle coming up on the inside. Why two? Well, <clears throat> if one doesn't work, in all probability the other one will. It's highly improbable that both emergency drop lead weights would not activate at the same time. But let's not talk about emergency procedures. These two are your final, these two drop lead weights, emergency drop lead weights, are your final two emergency procedures. Instead, let's talk about a normal surface. How do we normally get the submarine back to the surface? Well, as you remember, and this now we will use earlier when we discuss the dive. Then, reach out of the top of the hull, just forward of the conning tower, and you will see, or you will find, the main ballast tank blow valves. Put your right hand on the starboard one, and your left hand on the port one, open them a quarter of a turn, and within seconds you will be it on the surface. That's all there is to it. Just crack those two flow valves, which will put high pressure in into the forward and aft main ballast tanks, and you'll be on the surface in, in seconds. Now, <clears throat> I haven't included in this talk such optional equipment as a scrubber system, which Lloyd's, if it's a Lloyd certified submarine, we're required to uh, provide so that you can have 72 hours life support. Nor have I tried to describe our underwater telephone, which works on 23 kilohertz. Nor have I told you about the claw, which will pick up, with which you can pick up things from the bottom. If you have any questions about how the submarine operates or any of the optional equipment, don't hesitate to write and ask me, George Kittredge, and I will be most happy to answer your questions. Please include with your question a stamped self-addressed envelope.